you know, when you go through a, an audit, in this case an audit that flunks, King James only movement, it's not good to just end it and say, well, it flunked. Because the purpose of any kind of criticism is really not to criticize the object, but to learn better the wider subject. Um, in West Point, they make you study where people got it wrong in battles. Usually some pretty famous generals do. But they don't just leave it there. You're not supposed to just say, oh, well, Napoleon was dumb at Waterloo because blah, blah. You, you're not supposed to stop there. What you're supposed to do is take the material and say, okay, where am I making the same mistake? And what can I learn so that I get better out of this? That's the whole purpose of criticism. It is not really to criticize the object. So let's engage in that here. What have we learned from the King James Only movement? We learned they're pretty desperate. So one of the object lessons is, am I feeling desperate about A or B or whatever? To the extent I am, I'm making the same mistake they're making. They're desperate because they're lying. And their lies are, are easily proven lies within a five minute Google search. You can, In five minutes you can read the preface to the King James 1611. In five minutes you can search on mistranslation. You can search on KJV mistranslation. You can search on 1611 preface. You can search on Gail Rippling or Lied. You can just read the Bible Believers Bulletin of Peter Ruckman and in three seconds if you're not throwing up from the money pitches in it and the, the way the guy runs off at the mouth, then something's really wrong with you. In five minutes, you can look up a Jack Chick website and know immediately, hello, God is not a cartoon. Okay? In five minutes, you can look up Veith or Hovind or Gip and see how they're hawking for money. And immediately, you know something's wrong. So anybody who's King James only is not doing that. So they're desperate and they're uninterested in finding out the truth. So, uh-oh, am I like that on something else? That's a lesson to take away from this. Am I refusing to look at some truth? Is there some version or idea that I say is true about God and I refuse to research it okay in other words these people aren't auditing their claims and in five minute Google search you can prove them wrong so where are the rest of us not auditing our claims alright that's really important and there are a lot of claims people make that they don't audit the whole claim of limited atonement the Calvinists will not audit it and it's easy in five minutes to prove them liars okay the same thing is true for the pro-lifers okay there are 500 verses 57 of which in English had the word breath in them that prove the pro-lifers wrong but the pro-lifers won't audit it. They'll just claim that anybody who tries to counter them is pro-abortion. That's not true. The Jews all know that life begins at birth. The Jews are anti-abortion. The Jews are so anti-abortion, God had to prescribe abortion as a punishment. That's how anti-abortion Jews are. It was prescribed as a punishment under the Mosaic Law, Numbers 527, Episode 9 of my Pro-Life Blasphemy series goes through it in the Hebrew on screen to show you that the lexicographers all know that that's what this is, but they hide it in translation. It's politically covered up. Okay, so in, what, 10 minutes of watching one of my Episode 9 videos, you can know pro-life is a, is a blasphemy. Because if God orders an abortion, then there's no life in the womb. You get that? God does is not a murderer. So how many how many of our beliefs are we not auditing? 
I mean, we can sit here and point the finger at the KJVO or the Calvinist or the Catholic or the JW or the SCA. Okay, that's where we we can see the the you know the things that are wrong in their eyes. What about what's wrong in our own? That's the lesson always to take from this. It's a very scary experience to have to audit somebody else, especially when you can see how wrong they are. But now let's transcend even that because it's not about finger pointing really, it's about the bigger lessons. And let's come to the biggest lesson of all. How did Christ pay for our sins? Isaiah 53.11 tells us. In Hebrew the words are just two words. Bedato yatzdik. Bedato means by means of mastery of knowledge of truth. You need all those words in English to convey the, the full flavor of the Hebrew. Yatzdik means to make righteous. So, in English we'd say, by means of his mastery of knowledge of truth, he makes righteous. He paid for our sins. He made us righteous by means of his mastery of knowledge of truth. That's what it says in Isaiah 53.11. That's how he did it. And we know from the New Testament, he became, became the way, the truth, and the life. He became. Not, he did a lot of good deeds. Not, he did a lot of rituals. He didn't become good works. He didn't become rituals. He became the truth. And therefore the way. And therefore the life. But dato yatzdik. By means of mastery of truth knowledge, he makes righteous. Not by means of rituals. Not by means of works. And he himself said that in Matthew 4.4. 4. You will live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. From the mouth of God. Okay, well, when Christ said that, and he became the way, the truth, and the life, English was not a language. So he didn't become the truth through the English. The words that he learned are the words we still have. And those words we can prove were in Hebrew and Greek. And he learned them in Hebrew and Greek. Now the Hebrew was the original and the Greek was a translation. So we know that it's okay to use a translation. But we also know that a translation is not the words from the mouth of God. Because when God spoke to Moses, because you know it was the Old Testament that Christ learned. When God spoke to Moses and all the prophets, that was all. There's a little Chaldean there with Daniel and some Aramaic with Ezra and Nehemiah. So Christ learned what? Hebrew, Aramaic, Chaldean. Okay. And then there was also the Greek Old Testament translation which was done about 273 BC that Christ also learned and he quoted it a lot so do all the New Testament writers okay so that was the word that Christ learned the words from the mouth of God were the words originally given to the original writers of the books in whatever language they wrote so in Daniel that was chapters 1 through 7 was Chaldean and a little bit of Aramaic mixed in. And in Ezra, that was, you know, Aramaic. Some parts of Nehemiah also. But Moses, Hebrew, classical Hebrew. David, Hebrew. There's a smattering of, of Aramaic in there. Okay? The original words that the writer wrote were the original words preserved. And those are the words from the mouth of God. Now, obviously, it's okay to use the translation because Christ quoted from it. And we know that whatever he quoted from, that, that particular verse that he quoted from, and he, he concatenated them, and he also made specific changes to make wordplay, we know that that's, you know, we got the right quotes there. The rest of it, you have to test. 
So what do you know? In order to become the truth, in order to become like Christ, you have to learn the way Christ learned. Okay? Does it mean you you cannot learn in a translation? No, you, of course you can learn in a translation. He quoted from a translation, so it's okay. But it's not only okay. He learned it in Hebrew. He learned it in Aramaic. He learned it in the original words that, that God wrote. You, you will learn every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4 4. And obviously a translation is okay, but it's not alone. He didn't learn it alone. He didn't learn it only from the Greek Old Testament. And he didn't learn it only from the Hebrew. He used both. So that's what we ought to do. I'm sorry, but what was good enough for Christ is the command for us. That ought to be common sense. So right there and then, you know that the King James Only Movement is completely satanic. Because you know what? If this is what Christ had to do, that's what we got to do. And the whole New Testament is written in Greek. It wasn't written in English. Can you translate it? Yeah, in fact, you should keep on translating it. That's what the King James Bible translators themselves kept on saying in sections 9 through 10, you know, the last part of their uh, preface. Okay? Well, actually, through the first, the, the whole last half of their pref prefaces on this. Yeah, you keep retranslating. Every time you retranslate, you learn something new about the original. I, I'll never, you, nobody will ever be able to translate it all perfectly. But that's okay. When somebody translates something you said, they don't get it 100% right either, but they get the essence. There's something they, they get right. Okay. So, what Bible God gave us in the original is what we ought to learn. And yeah, you can learn it in translation too. Don't just do one or the other. Okay? Because if all you're learning from is the original, you don't know what insights you might get from a translation. And if all you're learning from the translation, you know what? You're not learning the way Christ learned. Christ became the way, the truth, and the life. That's the route we got to go. Now, the final statement on this. Christ became something in his soul. Bedato yatzdik. By means of the mastery of the knowledge of truth. Where is the knowledge of truth? It's not in your body. It's in your soul. So the size of your soul and the quality of your soul is what has to change. And your soul is the only thing you take with you. This body is going to go back to dust. The real you is your soul, not your body. Your body is just, you know, like an organic machine. It's never the human. The human is only your soul. So, if you're not learning and living on Bible, Matthew 4.4, 4, then the size of your soul is going to be really small. And you'll be happy in heaven. Oh yeah, I'm happy, all right, right, Jesus. Yeah, and that's as much as you'll know about him. Is that how you want it to go? Because as much as you want to know God, that's how much you're going to know him forever. And, as, and if you don't want to know him, if you want to know your rituals and your works and being nice to people, then that's what you'll know forever because with God you always get what you want so if you want to learn the original words that God preserved God will make you learn them how do you think I learned them 18 months using 1 John 1 9 every day it's real easy I never had to crack open a book that's your choice too bye